came to the podium mic. Slides are here. You don't need to look up at the screen and oh, advance you. there. How organized. Good morning. So as Russ Hopcroft said, uh, he was just came back from the field and we just came back from the field as well from a week ago. I was drilling through two meters of ice with a team of grad students and other uh, faculty and uh, temperatures of minus 30. So um, it's quite a change to be here. It's nice to be here. <laughs> We only had three cases of frostbite this time, actually up three from the last time. So it was a very, very cold spring in the Arctic. And as Russ could verify it in the Southern part of Alaska, and it was also very cold. In fact, the Inupiats uh, on the Arctic coast told me this is one of the coldest springs they've ever seen. So the ice was thick, it was hard, and it was, and uh, um, it was, and the air temperatures, like I said, were down to minus 30, uh, including wind chill. So, um, so some of our site news, uh, uh, we just, as Russ mentioned, a couple other sites just completed their renewals uh, on 2 March. We completed our, as I said, our, our, our ice field season here in April. Um, we had the two new PIs, uh, um, Vanessa Von Biela from the United States Geological Survey and Emily Adam at Oregon State. Um, we hosted, while we were up, uh, up, the, up north this period, we hosted two uh, outreach events big outreach events with uh, Nupia natives or indigenous people up at Gavik at Point Barrow and also at Bottle Island, a small community on the eastern Bobbisi coast of Canada. Uh, we called one of them pizza pictures and posters. That got people there. Um, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> 30 pizzas, $800. <laughs> <laughs> and out of Gavik at Soup and Science, run by the uh, uh, the UIC Corporation there at, at Barrow. Our grad students are doing well, very well. Um, they're, uh, they've, we've won two North Pacific Research Board grants, uh, over $50,000 recently. Um, and shout out to KBS since I'm here. Our first RE teacher was so excited. I can tell you that she, her Arctic nugget, her data nugget was accepted and published. So that was a really big, and that was done with uh, with our colleagues up at Ukia, up at uh, Kaktovik on Bader Island. So um, it's been it's been a really fun go. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, um, scaling for a moment, and uh, this is uh, involves our a huge effort in our part to understand DOM export, dissolved organic matter export into coastal Beaufort Sea. And the reason why this is important is that I'm not sure uh, how you look at DOM, but in our case. Uh, We've got organisms in the in the sediments and the water column that are that rate of carbon dating uh, three thousand years old, um, and uh, and that's because of terrestrial of what we, my advisor used to refer to as the carbon fossil fuel subsidy. Um, there's a tremendous amount of production goes through old basically older carbon on the Beaufort Sea coast, and we can see it um, very. Uh, it's documented very well in, in, in our measurements. So we're very interested in DOM and the amount of DOM reaching the coast. The only problem is we have 90, 196,000 kilometers of, of watersheds representing 42 watersheds. We have 530 kilometers of coastline and we have three nodes. Uh, there are Gavik, Prudhoe Bay and Kaktovik. So um, a lot of modeling and measurements uh, um, in rivers that, know, that we know a lot about. I'll mention those rivers in a second, but um, Mike Rollins produced a permafrost water balance model um, to estimate discharge and dissolved organic matter. Um, so, some of the challenges I'll mention right now, um, you can see on the right hand side, the winter uh, profiles, the active layer profiles during the spring, and then the fully thawed profiles in permafrost. And, and it's changing a lot. We're seeing um, uh, a uh, increased uh, cold, cold uh, period discharge because of thawing permafrost. The active layer is increasing in uh, in its extent, um, and uh, um, and so we're getting a lot more water uh, exiting the permafrost layer, and and a lot going as exiting as uh, as um, uh, uh, groundwater. Um, then, nonetheless, our model exercise provided very reasonable results based on that model, and uh, and data collected by graduate students working in the, in the mountains. I should have mentioned earlier, and I'll go back. One of the, one of the uh, aspects of, of this coastline is that we have a lot of mountainous terrain to the east and more uh, uh, tundra to the west. And that results in this gradient that you see here, where high DOM export in the west and low DOM export in the, in the east, where, where mountainous terrain, where the slope is very steep and a lot of leachates don't accumulate. So 
some of the challenges I already mentioned, but one of the other big challenges uh, is peak discharge um, is changing. It's 4.5 days earlier now than it has been across 42 rivers, uh, and we have to incorporate that into the model. So, and in, in terms of our success story, we see a nice gradient riverine di dissolved under carbon across the North Slope. Now we're asking the questions how those changes in DOC concentrations are impacting biological production since we know DOC levels are, they're very, very high and uh, because of the leachate from the tundra soils across this, this landscape. Um, so that's, uh, that's leading us into some of our next questions and, and research uh, on and cycle two of the VLE LTER. Thank you very much. Thank you.